Hi everyone, welcome to today's GCC Maths Revision video. There's two days to go to GCC Maths exam, so it's not tomorrow, it's the day after. So keep up the hard work, you're doing really well, you're getting there. And today we're doing the last of our recap videos, and today we're going to be focused on the geometry or the shapes based on measures topics, so things such as Pythagoras' theorem and things like that. So in today's video, we're going to be doing a recap of those topics. Uh, it might be useful for you to get a piece of paper and to jot some of the stuff down just to make sure that you remember it. Um, alternatively, just sit back and watch the video and just make sure you're confident with all the topics that we're going to be going through in terms of the geometry of the shapes, space and measure topic. So let's get started. Hi, today we're going to do a recap of the shape, space and measures or the geometry topics from the GCSE Higher Corp Maths Revision Checklist. There are all the topics in green. And if you want a more detailed explanation of those topics, if you go to the Ultimate GCSE Higher Revision video from 2 hours, 26 minutes and 41 seconds until 5 hours, 5 minutes and 17 seconds, I focus on these shape topics. But in this video, I'm going to do a recap of all those topics. So let's have a look at the topics. And these are the topics that we're going to be looking at. So let's get started. Angles and parallel lines. So make sure you know the different types of angles whenever you're dealing with parallel lines. So here we've got our alternate angles. Make sure you call them alternate angles and not Z angles, but they're alternate angles there and there. They're the same as each other. Corresponding angles are equal to each other as well. So the bottom right here and the bottom right, or the top right and the top right, top left and top left, bottom left and bottom left. So they would all be corresponding angles to each other and they're equal to each other. Also, whenever you're dealing with parallel lines, you may encounter co-interior angles. So this angle and this angle will add together to be 180 degrees. So if you've got co-interior angles, they add together to be 180 degrees. And vertically opposite angles. If you've got two straight lines that cross each other, the opposite angles will be equal to each other because they're vertically opposite. So this is 135 and this is 135 and this angle is 45 degrees and that angle is 45 degrees. So it's important to know those alternate corresponding co-interior and vertically opposite angles. Okay, next, let's have a look at bearings. So bearings are a direction of travel measured clockwise from north. So if, for instance, I wanted to find the bearing off Castletown from Milton, what I would do is I'd first of all join up Castletown and Milton, like so. I would then draw a north line at Milton because we want the bearing from Milton. So I'd draw the north line at Milton, like so. And then I want to measure the size of the angle clockwise from north until that line we've drawn. So I'd want us to measure the size of that angle. I then get my protractor, I'd measure the size of that angle. Let's pretend it's equal to 40 degrees. So if that angle was equal to 40 degrees, then the bearing of Castletown from Milton would be 0, 4, 0 degrees. Always make sure the bearings have got three digits. So if it's less than 100, make sure you put that zero in front of it. So that's how you measure bearings. If I wanted to find the bearing of Milton from Castletown, I would draw a north line at Castletown, and then I'd measure the size of that reflex angle going clockwise from north all the way around to here. And I'd measure the size of that angle, and that'll be the bearing of Milton from Castletown, and that's it. Now it's also important to be able to work out back bearing. So the bearing of Nottingham from Dublin is 0, 0,98 degrees. What's the bearing of Dublin from Nottingham? So that's finding the bearing going the other way. Now you could do that doing little sketches and stuff, and that's fantastic. But a bit of a shortcut is if, if it's less than 180 degrees, you can just add 180 degrees, and that'll tell you the back bearing. And if the bearing that you're given is 180 degrees or larger, you then take away 180 degrees. So if I wanted to find the bearing of Dublin from Nottingham, I can just take 0, 0,98 and add 180 degrees, and that's equal to... 278 degrees. So that would be the back bearing, it would be the bearing going the other way. You could show it using a sketch as well. And your sketch would look something like that, where you've got Dublin, you've got Nottingham, you've got your 98 degree angle, joining them up. You then use your co-interior angles, they add together to be 180 degrees, so you can find the size of that one, and then take that away from 360 to find the size of that angle, and then that would be the back bearing, the angle measured clockwise from north. And that's it. Okay, so we've looked at the angles in a triangle and the angles in a quadrilateral. The angles in a pentagon add up to be 540 degrees, and I tend to learn that off by heart. The angles in a hexagon add up to be 720 degrees, and again, I tend to learn that one off by heart. And then I learn on every single side that we're adding. We're adding another 180 degrees to the sum of the interior angles. So for a heptagon, we just add another 180 degrees. For an octagon, we add another 180 degrees and so on. And you can use this formula that if you take the number of sides and take away two, and then multiply that answer by 180, you get the sum of the interior angles. So for instance, for an octagon, I would do eight take away two, which is six, and then times 180, which is equal to 1080. And some other useful information whenever we're dealing with polygons is that the sum of the exterior angles will always be 360 degrees. So no matter how many sides the polygons got, all the exterior angles, all these red angles will always add together to be 360 degrees. Another useful bit of information is that the interior angle and an exterior angle will always add together to be 180 degrees. So if I know that this is 72 degrees, I can find the size of the interior angle. I would do 180 minus 72, and that's equal to 108. And that's it. Okay, so let's have a look at a typical question. It says, work out the size of each interior angle of a 12-sided regular polygon. So it's a regular polygon, so that means all the angles are the same size, and it's got 12 sides. Now, there's two different ways you can approach this. One is you could take 12 and then take away 2. 
that's equal to 10 and multiply that by 180. So that's going to be equal to 1800 degrees. So that's the sum of the interior angles in a regular 12 sided polygon. And then if I take the 1800 and divide that by 12, that's equal to 150 degrees. So that means each one of the interior angles in this regular 12 sided polygon will be 150 degrees. Now there is also another approach. Because we know that all the exterior angles always add together to be 360, we could do 360 divided by 12, and that's equal to 30 degrees. So each one of the exterior angles is 30 degrees, and then we could do 180 take away 30, and that's equal to 150 degrees. And that's it. So that's some useful information whenever you're dealing with angles and polygons. Constructions. Make sure that you're able to construct the angle by sector, the perpendicular by sector, and so on. These videos will be useful for those. And these diagrams probably just give you a bit of a recap in terms of how to do it. So for an angle by sector, you'd get the point of the compass here. You then do an arc here and here, making sure the compass stays the same size. Then you put the point of the compass here, you do an arc towards the middle somewhere, and then you keep it the same size and put the point here and do an arc towards the middle somewhere. And wherever they cross, you just draw a line through that, and then that would be the angle bisector. We would cut the angle in half. And then for the perpendicular bisector, just set it over halfway the length of the line. So put the point here and set the pencil over here somewhere. Do an arc above and below. Keeping the compass the same size, put the point on the other side and do another one above and below. And then you just join up where they cross, and then that's going to be the perpendicular bisector sector so make sure you know how to do those constructions and these videos will be useful okay next you may encounter loci questions so remember that's perhaps showing on a diagram particular regions that would satisfy some rules so here we've got a boat is within eight miles of a and five miles of b and we've been asked to shade the possible positions of the boat and we've got the one centimeter is equal to one mile so what you do is you'd get your compass you'd set it to eight centimeters in terms of the distance the radius that circle you'd put the point on a and then you do an arc now i'm guessing the boat's at c here i should have already said that in the question and then you do your arc going around then you'd set it to five centimeters and then put the point on b and then you'd do an arc as well and because it's within eight miles of a and five miles of b the regions that are within both of those then would satisfy that now you would shade that and that would be the possible positions of the boat it might be useful with loci to watch these videos and to try the practice questions they'll be handy as well views and elevations so if you've got a shape and you we want to draw the different views the view from the front is called the front elevation so the view from the front is called the front elevation the view from the side is called the side elevation it can be from that side or that side so you've got the side elevations the view from either of the sides and the plan view is the view from the top so make sure you can draw the front elevations the side elevations the plan view and so on Okay, next, air of a trapezium. Sometimes you might need to be able to find the air of a trapezium, such as this shape here. And if we wanted to find the air of a trapezium, the formula is a half, A plus B, multiplied by H. In other words, you add together the lengths of the two parallel sides, first of all. You then half that, so 7 plus 11 is equal to 18. You half that to 9, and then times by the height, the distance between them. 9 times 5 is equal to 45, so that would be 45 centimeters squared. And that's it, so you use this to find the air of a trapezium, half brackets A plus B times H. And that's given to you, so if you need a bit of a recap on finding the air of a trapezium, go to the formula sheet and you can find it but if you remember it fantastic so in terms of circumference circumference is pi times diameter so if you multiply the diameter of the circle by pi you get the circumference so if I wanted to find the circumference of the circle I would just do pi multiplied by 14 and if it's a calculator question I would just do that on my calculator and get my answer and that'll be so many centimeters if it was a non-calculator question instead of doing it on my calculator I would just write 14 pi centimeters and that's it you just put them together and put the number in front but if it's a calculator question just type it into your calculator press equals and that'll be the circumference of the circle if you want to find the area of a circle you do pi r squared so here we've got a circle with radius 6 so i would do pi multiplied by 6 squared if it's a calculator question i would just type in pi times 6 squared in my calculator and then i'd press equals and what i get in my calculator would be the answer and then i'd make sure that i use the right units which would be centimeters squared if it was a non-calculator question, I have to square first. Remember the order of operations, 6 squared is 36. So the answer would be 36 pi centimeters squared in a non-calculator test. And that's it. You may also need to be able to find the perimeter or areas of semicircles and quarter circles. So if I wanted to find the area of these, for this one, I'd find the area of the whole circle. I would do pi times 3 squared, get the area of the whole circle, and then just half it. And that would be the area of that semicircle. If I wanted the area of this quarter circle, I would turn it into a whole circle. I would do pi times 15 squared because for the whole circle 15 is the radius so I do pi times 15 squared to get the area of the whole circle and then just divide it by 4 and that will be the area of that quarter circle if I wanted to find the perimeter of this semicircle what I would do is I would turn it into a whole circle I would do pi times diameter so the diameter of the whole circle is 6 so I would do pi times 6 to get the circumference of the whole circle and then half that and that would tell me that distance that arc length there from there around to there and then I would just add on 6, the length for that side, and then that would be the perimeter of that semicircle. And for this quarter circle, I would turn it into a whole circle. 
I would do pi times diameter, which is pi times 30. So that would be the circumference of the whole circle. And then I would divide that by 4 to find the length of that arc. And then I would just add on 15 and 15, and that will be the perimeter of that quarter circle. If you're given a sector that's a little bit trickier than a quarter circle or semicircle, you might want to use this formula. So if you want to find the length of that arc, you would take the number of degrees, you would divide it by 360, because that's the fraction of the circle, and then times it by the circumference, which is pi times diameter. And then that will tell you the length of that arc. So if you take this angle, put it over 360 and multiply by pi and then the diameter of the whole circle which would be 16 that'll tell you the length of that part that arc and then if I wanted the perimeter of this sector then add on 8 and add on 8 and then that'll be the perimeter of that sector and likewise for the area we take the fraction of the circle so we put the angle over 360 so 109 over 360 and then multiply by the area of the circle you do pi r squared so pi times 0.7 squared and then multiply that by 109 over 360 and then that'll tell you the area of that sector Okay, you may need to find the volume of a cylinder, and using a similar approach, you just find the area of the circle and multiply it by the height of the cylinder. So we would do pi r squared, we would do pi times 8 squared. We'd get that for the area of the circle, and then we just times it by 30. So that would be our answer. We would just get the area of the circle and times it by 30, and that would give us the volume of the cylinder. Okay, make sure you know Pythagoras' theorem. So Pythagoras' theorem is a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So the, so the two shorter sides, you label them a and b, and the longer side, the hypotenuse, you label that c. And then you write down Pythagoras' theorem, which is a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And then you replace a, b, and c by their values. So a was 5, so we've got 5 squared plus b squared, which is 12 squared, equals c squared, which is x squared. 5 squared is 25, plus 12 squared is 144, equals x squared. When you add these together, you get 169 equals x squared. This side is obviously not equal to 169 centimeters. That's x squared. So we then square root that. So x is equal to the square root of 169, which is equal to 13. So x equals 13 centimeters. And that's it. That's the length of that side. So make sure you know Pythagoras' theorem. A squared plus b squared equals c squared. And it can be quite useful whenever you've got triangles like so. But also if you're asked to find the length of diagonals and rectangles and things like that. Have a go at the practice questions as well. They're quite useful. Okay. Okay, so with trigonometry, you need to make sure you know your trig ratios. The sine of an angle is opposite divided by hypotenuse. The cos of an angle is adjacent divided by hypotenuse. And the tan of an angle is equal to the opposite divided by the adjacent. I remember them as two old angels skipped over heaven carrying a harp. Some people remember Sokato and so on. So you need to make sure you know those trig ratios. And some students may use these triangles. So for instance, if you want to find the sine of an angle, you do opposite divided by hypotenuse. If you wanted to work out the adjacent here, you do the cos of the angle multiplied by the hypotenuse and so on. And with two days ago, you use whatever approach that you like the best and now if for instance if we wanted to find the sides of this angle using trigonometry we would label the sides opposite the right angle is the hypotenuse opposite the angle is the opposite and the other side is the adjacent in this question we're using the adjacent and the hypotenuse so we're not using the opposite so we can cross that off so we're using adjacent and the hypotenuse so that's going to be cos that's the cos of the angle cos x equals adjacent divided by hypotenuse and you can remember that either by knowing your trig ratios or by knowing your triangles so you can write down the cos of the angle is equal to the adjacent divided by hypotenuse now let's substitute in the values the cos of the angle is equal to the adjacent, which is 8 divided by the hypotenuse, which is 10. The size of this angle obviously isn't equal to 8 tenths of a degree, so we need to do the inverse cos. So x is equal to the inverse cos, the cos of little minus 1, of 8 tenths. And whenever you type that into your calculator, you get the answer. And that's equal to 36.87 degrees. And that's it. So trigonometry just makes sure you label the sides, you cross off the one you're not using, you write down the trig ratio that you need to use in the question, you substitute in the values, and then you just solve it to find x. Likewise, you can use it to find the length of a side. So here we've got a right angle triangle again. Let's label the sides, the hypotenuse, the opposite, and the adjacent. In this question, we're not using the adjacent, so we cross that off. So this time we're using the opposite and the hypotenuse. So that's going to be sine, the sine of the angle. So sine vita is equal to the opposite divided by the hypotenuse. Now we're going to substitute our values. The so sine of the angle, so the sine of 60 degrees, is equal to the opposite, which is x, divided by the hypotenuse, which is 4. We want to solve this to find x, so we're going to multiply both sides by 4. So we're going to multiply by 4, multiply by 4. On the right-hand side, we multiply by 4 to get rid of the divide by 4, so we're just going to be left with x. And on the left-hand side, we have the sine of 60, so the sine of 60 times 4. And whenever we do the sine of 60, close brackets, times 4 in our calculator, we get that's equal to 2 root 3, or 3.464. 
kilometers to three decimal places and that's equal to x and that's it so we find the length for that side and again if you use the triangle you would have done that triangle there if you wanted to find the opposite you cover that up so you just do sine of the angle times the hypotenuse and that's it so you just do sine of 60 times the hypotenuse 4 and that's it also it can be quite useful to know your exact trig values so obviously the sine of 0 is 0 the sine of 30 is a half the sine of 45 is root 2 over 2 the sine of 60 is root 3 over 2 and the sine of 90 is equal to 1 the cos of 0 is equal to 1 the cos of 30 is equal to root 3 over 2 the cos of 45 is equal to root 2 over 2 the cos of 60 is a half and the cos of 90 is equal to 0 and the tan of 0 is 0 the tan of 30 is root 3 over 3 the tan of 45 is 1 the tan of 60 degrees is root 3 and the tan of 90 degrees is undefined it's the asymptote okay so we've had a look at pythagoras and trigonometry now we may encounter trigonometry and pythagoras in three dimensions so here's a cuboid and we've been asked to find the length of a g so we want to find the length of this diagonal from a to g so from a up to g the length of that diagonal there and if I wanted to find the length of that diagonal, well, I would actually notice here that this is a right angle triangle. If I join up from A to C, that's a right angle triangle. Let's actually just label that. And we've got the lengths of one of the sides, CG. And if we could find one more length, perhaps AC, we could then use Pythagoras to find the length of AG. Now, if we have a look here at the base, we've got a rectangle. The base is a rectangle. And we've cut it across diagonally. So that means that this is a right angle triangle, ABC. So let's sketch triangle ABC. So there we've got triangle ABC. AB was six centimeters. BC was equal to two centimeters. And AC is that diagonal, the one we want to find. So we could use Pythagoras' theorem. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. And then if we square root, we get c is equal to the square root of 40. Now, quite often with these 3D trigonometry and Pythagoras questions, it's actually handy to leave it as a surge because we may need to use that again in a moment. So I'm just going to write here the square root of 40 for the length of AC. Okay, so we now know the length of AC, the square root of 40 centimeters. We've got the length of CG. We can now use Pythagoras' theorem again with this right angle triangle ACG to find the length of the hypotenuse AG. So let's do that. Okay, so as you can see, here's our triangle. We've got CG is 3 centimetres, AC is equal to root 40 centimetres, and AG is what we're trying to find. Let's just call that X. We get that X squared is equal to 49. So that means that X, if we square root that, is equal to 7. So the length of that diagonal is equal to 7 centimetres, and that's it. So if you're doing Pythagoras questions in three dimensions, you might often have to use Pythagoras' theorem more than once to find certain lengths, and then you can then answer the question. Okay, next, 3D trigonometry. Okay, let's have a look at our next question. So our next question says, find the size of angle CAG. So angle C A G would be C A G. I want to find the size of angle C A G. So that's the size of this angle in here, this angle there, theta. So that's a right angle triangle again. And if we knew the lengths of two of the sides of this right angle triangle, we could use trigonometry to find the size of the angle. Now we know one of them. And if we have a look here, if we've got the same rectangle in the bottom, and we've cut it diagonally. If we find the length of A C, which was root 40, remember whenever we done Pythagoras' theorem on the base, we found that that was equal to root 40 centimeters. We've now got a triangle, this triangle A C G, where we've got the lengths of two sides. We've got, so let's sketch it. So if we wanted to find the size of the angle CAG, well, we've got the opposite. We've got the adjacent. We don't have the hypotenuse, so we would be using tan. So we just write the tan of theta is equal to the opposite, which is 3, divided by the adjacent, which is root 40. And then you could just solve that. You could just do the inverse tan of that, and then you'd find the size of that angle. So that's it. So 3D trigonometry and Pythagoras, just be prepared to split the shade apart, find right angle triangles, and so on. You might also need to find the volume of a prism, and to find the volume of a prism, you find the cross-sectional area, so that's the bit that's constant through the shape, multiplied by the length. So here we've got this triangular prism, the cross-section is this triangle, and if we find the area of the triangle, and multiply by the length, we'll find the volume of the prism. So remember for a triangle, we do half the base times the height, so we do a half of 7 multiplied by 5, a half of 7 times 5, well 7 times 5 is 35, so a half of 35. And that's equal to 17.5 meters squared. That's the area of the front. Now to find the volume, what times about how long it is. So we just take our 17.5 and multiply that by 4. And that's equal to 17 meters cubed. And that's it. So to find the volume of this prism, we find the area of the cross section, the triangle, and just multiply it by the length. Okay, if you want to find the volume of a sphere, this formula is given to you. Just, just go to the formula sheet for the volume of a sphere. And it's 4 thirds pi r cubed. So we would just do 4 thirds multiplied by pi multiplied by the radius of the sphere, which is 14 cubed. And you can just type that into your calculator and work it out if it's a calculator question. If it's in a non-calculator test, what you do is you get the radius and you'd cube it. I guess it'd be quite a, a bit of a nicer number than 14, so you'd cube whatever number it is. You'd work out four thirds of it, and then you just put it in front of pi, and then that would be your answer. And that's it. So make sure you know how to find the volume of a sphere. Remember, the formula is given to you, and you just need to substitute in the value. And if it's on the calculator paper, you can just type it in. And also make sure you put down the right unit. So here it would be centimeters cubed.
Okay, next, the volume of a cone. So the volume of a cone, again, is given to you as a third pi r squared h, where r is the radius of the base and h is the height of the cone. So you can just substitute those in and find that in the calculator test. So you just do a third multiply by pi, multiply by the radius of the base, which is 20 squared, multiply by the height of the cone, which is 21. And you can just type that into your calculator and work it out. And that's it. And so the volume of a cone is a third the area of the base, so a third the area of the circle, multiplied by the height. And that's it. And if it's on a non-calculator paper, you just need to work out this part. You square the radius and times it by the height, and then you just divide it by three, and then just put the pi after it, and that'll be the volume of the cone on a non-calculator test. Okay, next, the volume of a pyramid. So in terms of the volume of a pyramid, you're gonna to need to learn this formula, but actually remember the volume of a cone is given to you, and the volume of a cone is, the volume of a cone is a third pi r squared h. And think what pi r squared is. It's the area of the base of the cone. It's the area of that circle. So the volume of a pyramid is a third, the area of the base times the height. So it's really just the same as the cone, but instead of obviously it's not going to be a circle, it might be a rectangle or a square or a triangle or so on, depending on what type of pyramid you've got. So the volume of a pyramid is found by doing a third the area of the base times the height. So if I wanted to find the volume of this pyramid, I would do a third times the area of the base, which would be six times nine. You would do six times nine to get the area of the base, times the height, which would be seven. And then you just work that out and that would be the volume of that pyramid. And remember it would be in centimeters cubed. And that's it. Okay, so next we're going to look at the volume of a frustrum. So here we've got a frustrum. And remember, a frustrum is just a cone or a pyramid with the top chopped off. So here we've got a cone with the top chopped off. And if we wanted to find the volume of this frustrum, we're told the perpendicular height of the original cone is 20 centimeters. So the original cone goes up another 10 centimeters, so another 10 centimeters, and it would have reached the height up here. So that's my sketch of what the cone would have looked like. And then we've cho chopped the top off. So if I wanted to find the volume of the frustrum, what was left, I would find the volume of the whole cone to begin with. So remember the volume of a cone, the volume is equal to a third pi r squared h. So we're gonna do, for the whole cone, we would do a third multiplied by pi, multiplied by the radius of the base, which is eight, and then squared, multiplied by the height of the whole cone, which is 20. That would have given us the volume of the whole original cone. Then what I would do is then work out the volume of the cone that was chopped off. So that would be a third, and then multiplied by pi, multiplied by the radius of the base, which is four, squared, multiplied by the height of that cone, which is 10. And then once you work out the volume of that cone, then you can just take it away from the original cone to find out what's left, the volume of that frustum, and that's it. Also, you may need to find the surface area of sphere. And again, that formula is given to you, four pi r squared. So you just do four multiplied by pi, multiplied by the radius, which is five squared. On a calculator paper, you just type it into the calculator. Non-calculator paper, you just work it out and just put the pi after it, and that's it. And remember, unit centimeter squared. Okay, next, surface area of a cone. So in terms of surface area of the cone, if you're asked to find the total surface area of the cone, you're gonna need to work out the curved surface area on the top and also the area of the circle on the bottom. Now you're given the formula for the curved surface area on the top, so you do pi RL, that's pi, multiplied by the radius of the base, which is six, multiplied by L, the length of that diagonal, you do that and that'll give you the curved surface area and then you then also need to work out the area of the circle on the bottom so you do pi times six squared to find the area of that circle and then add them up and that's the total surface area of the cone. Okay, so sometimes we might need to convert metric units for area and metric units for volume. So if I wanted to change from meters squared into centimeters squared, we could times this by 10,000 by just learning that one meter squared is equal to 10,000 centimeters squared. That's one approach and you could just times this by 10,000 to get 60,000 centimeters squared. Alternatively, what I do is I multiply by 100 and then by 100 again. So I get six, so times by 100, that'll be 600, and times by 100 again, which would be 60,000 centimeters squared, and that's it. Here, if I wanted to change from meters cubed into centimeters cubed, I could learn that one meter cubed is equal to one million centimeters cubed. So, and then I could find the volume of this, which would be two times two times two, which would be eight meters cubed. And if I wanted to find the volume of this in centimeters, what I could do is I could just times about a million to get eight million centimeters cubed. Alternatively, because I know I've done the length times the width times the height, I would then times about 100, by 100, about 100 again, and that would also give me eight million centimeters cubed. Okay, next, translations. So there's different transformations that you may encounter in GCSE Maths. So one is a translation, that's where you slide a shape. So we're gonna slide this shape. And we've been asked to translate by this vector. This is a vector, and we've got minus one, five. The number at the top tells you how many squares left or right to translate it. If it's negative, it means to the left. If it's positive, it means to the right. If it's zero, it doesn't move left or right. The number beneath that would be how many squares up or down. If it's positive, that'll be up. If it's negative, it'll be down. If it's zero, it doesn't move up or down. So this vector is telling 
telling us to move the shape one square to the left and five squares up. And that's it, we've translated shape C by negative one, five, and make sure you know what those vectors mean. The top number is how many left or right, negative to the left, positive to the right, and the bottom number is up or down, positive up, negative down. Okay, next, reflections. So in terms of reflection shapes, you may be asked to reflect something in the x-axis or y-axis. So if, for instance, we're asked to reflect this in the y-axis, we would choose a point, for instance, this one. It's one squared to the y-axis, so we then go in of one to there. This point here is one, two, three to the y-axis, so we go three, one, two, three to here. And this point is one, two, three to the y-axis, so we go in of three, one, two, three. And then you just join them up, and then that'll be that shape C reflected in the y-axis. If it was the x-axis, you would do the same, but you would count down to the x x-axis. You might also be asked to reflect it in lines such as x equals negative 1 and then you draw the line of x equals negative 1. So that's the line x equals negative 1 and again you just choose each of the points and you just go 1, 2 to the line, 1, 2 and so on. If it was y equals 1 perhaps you draw the horizontal line passing through 1 on the y-axis. So then you'd reflect that triangle and that line and so on. So it's important to know those lines, those x equals lines and those y equals lines. And you may also be asked to reflect a shape in the line y equals x or y equals negative x. So just know that the line y equals x would look like this. So that's the line y equals x. It would look something like that. Just the diagonal line passing through 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, negative 1, negative 1, and so on. And that's the line y equals minus x. For instance, 1, negative 1, 2, negative 2, negative 1, 1, and so on. So that's the line y equals negative x. And if we wanted to reflect this in that line, we choose a point and we just count the diagonals. One diagonal and a half. So it's one and a half diagonal. So we go a half and one to so move to there. This point is one, two and a half. So we go a half, one, two to there. And this point up here would be one, two, three and a half diagonal. So we go a half, one, two, three and it would move to there. And then just join those up. Okay, next, rotations. So in the exam, you're entitled to tracing paper. So put up your hand and ask for tracing paper in the exam. You might want to ask for it at the very beginning before it even begins, just so you've got your tracing paper on your desk. And if we wanted to rotate this rectangle 90 degrees anti-clockwise about the point 2, negative 1, the first thing I would do is I plot that center of rotation 2, negative 1 on the grid. So 2, negative 1 is here. I would then get my tracing paper and put it on top of that like so and I'd make sure that it's either landscape or portrait then what I would do is I would trace over the center of rotation and the rectangle then I'd get my pencil and put it on top of the center of rotation and gently rotate the paper the tracing paper 90 degrees anti-clockwise remember that anti-clockwise is that way and that clockwise is that way and if you need a bit of a hint look at the clock in the exam hall and to think which way is clockwise the way the clock hands on the clock go and which way is anti-clockwise and then you just get your tracing paper and you rotate and then you just rotate the tracing paper 90 degrees anti-clockwise and it was landscape and now it's portrait and then you just draw that rectangle on that position on the grid and that's it Okay, in terms of enlarging shapes, we've been asked to enlarge B by scale factor 2 using 4, 3 as the center of enlargement. So 4, 3 would be there. Each of these points are going to become twice as far away from the center of enlargement. So this point here is 1, 2, 3 to the left. So we're going to go 6 to the left. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. That's going to move to there. This point is 1, 2 to the left. So we're going to go 4 to the left. 1, 2, 3, 4. This point down here is 2 to the left and 2 down. So we're going to go four to the left and four down, one, two, three, four. And this point here was three to the left and two down, so we're gonna go six to the left and four down. So one, two, three, four, five, six, and four down would be there. And then we just join that up, and that's how you enlarge a shape on a grid. Now also with enlargements, we may encounter negative scale factors. So if I wanted to enlarge this square by negative so if I wanted the largest square by a scale factor negative 4 using center negative 3, negative 1 as a center of enlargement, I plot the center of enlargement to begin with, and I do each point at a time, and it's going to become four times over further. And with and each of these points are going to become four times further away, but in the opposite direction. So in terms of this point, instead of being 1 to the left, we're going to go 4 to the right. 1, 2, 3, 4. So we've done that point. This point, instead of being 2 to the left, we're going to go 8 to the right. So we go back to the center of enlargement. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Next, this point here is 1 to the left and 1 down. So we're going to go 4 to the right and 4 up. So 4 to the right and 4 up. 1, 2, 3, 4. And this point down here, it's 2 to the left and 1 down. So we're going to go 8 to the right and 4 up. And then that would be there. And there's, our four and there's the four corners. We just join them up. And that's it with enlarge that and that's it with enlarge that square by scale factor negative four. I just remember when it's a negative scale factor it goes in the opposite direction. So rather than going to the left, we go to the right and so on. 
And just remember, whenever it's a negative scale factor, instead of going to, for instance, to the left and down, we would go to the right and up. We would just go in the opposite direction. Okay, next. Okay, next. Similar shapes. If the scale factor for enlargements for the sides is n, the scale factor for the areas would be n squared. So here, for instance, if the sides are three times bigger, the area would be three squared is nine. So it'd be nine times bigger. If the scale factor for the sides was four, the area would be 16 times bigger and so on. And that's really useful. And the scale factor for the volume would be n cubed. So for instance, with these cubed as you can see, the sides are two times larger, so the scale factor of enlargement for the sides is two. 2 cubed, 2 times 2 times 2 is 8, so the volume is 8 times larger. So this is really important to remember this information. Scale factor for the size is n, for the area it'd be n squared, and for the volume it's n cubed. And if you can remember this, it'd be really useful because then, for instance, you might be given shapes where you can then work out the scale factor perhaps for the sides, and then you might be able to find missing areas or missing volumes and things like that. Okay, next. Okay, next, circle theorem. So it's important you know your circle theorems. So the first one, the angle in the semicircle is 90 degrees. So if you've got the diameter and then the two lines go up and meet at a point like so, that'll be a 90 degree angle. Next, if you've got the center and you've got two radii that go to the circumference and then they go and meet at another point on the circle, then the angle at the circumference will be half the angle at the center. So as you can see, 60 is half of 120. Next, the angles in the same segment from a common chord are equal. So if you've got two points here and here, and you've got lines that go up and meet here and here and here and here, those two angles will be the same. Next, cyclic quadrilaterals. If you've got a cyclic quadrilateral, which is a quadrilateral with all four points on the circle, the opposite angles will add to be 180 degrees. So that's important, the opposite angles in a cyclic quadrilateral will, will add to 180 degrees. Okay, next, the radius and the tangent will always meet at 90 degrees. So if you get a tangent to the circle at a particular point, if you draw the radius to that point, it'll be 90 degrees between the radius and the tangent. Okay, next, alternate segment theorem. So if you've got a tangent and then a triangle inside of the circle like so, the angle between the tangent and the chord, this angle here, would be equal to the opposite angle inside the triangle. And likewise, this angle would be equal to the opposite angle inside the triangle. So that's called alternate segment theorem. Okay, next, the tangents to a circle from the same point will be equal in length. So CD would be the same length as CE. And then finally, if you've got a chord, the radius that passes through the midpoint of the chord will bisect the chord at 90 degrees. And that's it. So they're the circle theorems, and they're very important that you know those circle theorems. Okay, next. Now, we can still use trigonometry for triangles that aren't right angle triangles, and we would use either the sine rule or the cosine rule. So in terms of the sine rule, if you've got sides and angles opposite each other, then you can use A over sine A equals B over sine B equals C over sine C. So if I wanted to find the length of this side here, I would write A over sine A, so I'd write X over sine 45 would be equal to, and then I would have 9 over sine 85, 9 over sine 85. And so x over sine 45 would equal 9 over sine 85. And then you could just solve this. You could work this out and then multiply both sides by sine 45. And then you'd just be left with x. And then you'd know the length of that side. So that means you can find the length of that side. So we've used the sine rule to work out the length of a side of a triangle that's not a right angle triangle. You can also use the sine rule to work out the size of angles. So for instance, if I knew the length of this side and wanted to find the size of this angle, well, I could use the sine rule as well. But what I would do is I'd flip it over. So I'd write sine a over little a equals sine b over little b. So I would use this version if I wanted to find the length of a side, and I would use this version if I wanted to find the size of an angle, just flipping it over. It just makes it a bit easier to solve it and to find the size of the angle. So make sure you know how to use the sine rule, and you use it whenever you've got sides and angles opposite each other. Now, as well as the sine rule, we can also use the cosine rule. And the cosine rule is really useful whenever you get the length of two sides and the angle in between them. You can use the cosine rule, which is a squared equals b squared plus c squared minus 2bc cos a. So you can find the length of this side here if you know the length of the two sides and the angle in between them. So if I wanted to find the length of this side here, I could use the cosine rule. I would write down x squared equals b squared plus c squared, so that's going to be 20 squared plus 15 squared, minus 2bc, so that's going to be minus 2 times 20 times 15, multiplied by the cos of the angle, so cos of 120. And if this was a calculator test, you could just type that in and then work out what x squared is and then square it to find the size of x. And that's it. And the cosine rule is given to you, so you don't need to learn off by heart. You can just go to the formula shape. So if you've got two sides and the angle in between them, you can use the cosine rule to work out the length of that third side. Also, you can use the cosine rule to find the size of an angle if you know all three sides because you could then put in A, B, and C into the cosine rule and then you could solve it to find cos A. You can use the cosine rule to find the size of the angle. And also, we can find the area of a triangle by using trigonometry. We can use the formula half A, B, sine C. So if you've got two sides and the angle in between them, you can do a half A, B, sine C to find the area of the triangle. So here I would do a half multiplied by 8, multiplied by 14, multiplied by the sine of the angle in between them. And if I work that out, I would find the area of that triangle. 
and that's it. And that's really useful to find the area of triangles as well. Okay, next, vectors. So vectors can be represented on a diagram like so, or as a column vector. They're represented as a column vector. Think back to translations. This vector is going one, two, three, four, five to the right. So it's going to be five. And then it's going one, two down. So this would be the vector of five minus two. And that's how I would write that as a column vector. Also, you may encounter questions involving column vectors. You might be told, for instance, a is equal to three, negative one, and b is equal to four, six. You might be asked to work out things such as two a. Well, that means you just double those. That'll be six minus two. Or you might be asked to find a plus b, and that means you just add them together, which would be equal to 7, uh, because 3 plus 4 is 7, and minus 1 plus 6 would be 5, and so on. So you just work them out, and I like those column vector questions. You might encounter vectors on a diagram. So for instance, if we know that from O to A is equal to little a, and from O to D is equal to little b, if we want to find it from O to G, we would just do a plus a plus a plus b. So it'll be 3a plus b. And that would be the vector OG because it's 3A plus B. And that's it. And also with vectors, you may encounter questions that involve showing the lines are parallel to each other or even the three points in a straight line and things like that. So here, if I wanted to show that EG and DF are parallel, so EG is from E to G there, and DF is from there to there. If I wanted to show that EG and DF are parallel, what I would do is I would find the vector EG. Now these are parallelograms, so that means that if that's A, that's A, and then if that's B, that's B. So the vector from E to G would be minus 2A plus 2B. And I would find the vector DG. So these are all parallelograms here, here, and here. So that's going to be little a going that way, and that's going to be little b going that way. So from D to F would be, would be minus A plus B. And as you can see, the vector EG is a multiple of the vector EF. It's just twice as big. And to show the vectors are parallel to each other, you show the multiples of each other. So I've just written down that EG, the vector EG, is double the vector DF. So therefore, they're parallel. And that's it. And if you wanted to show the three points lay in the same line, so for instance, if we're asked to show that E, C, and G were all in the same line, I'd find the vector from E to C, I'd find the vector from C to G. If they're parallel to each other and they both pass through the point C, then that means it must be a straight line. Speed, distance, and time. So speed is found by doing the distance divided by the time. And make sure that if, for instance, you're dealing with miles per hour and you've got one and a half hours, make sure you're doing 1.5 for the time. Or if it's two hours and 15 minutes, it's two and a quarter hours. That's going to be 2.25 and so on. So make sure you know how to do speed is distance divided by time. Distance is equal to speed times time. And time is equal to distance divided by speed. And I often just remember this by remembering what speed is, miles per hour. So for instance, it was 30 miles per hour and I traveled for four hours I would just do 30 times 4 and that's equal to 120. Some students may use this to remember it which is a triangle and if you wanted to find speed you'd put your finger or cover up speed and you'd do distance divided by time. If you wanted to find time you'd cover up the 10 you'd do distance divided by speed and if you wanted to find distance you cover that up and you do speed times time. However you remember it with two days to go and you're doing speed distance and time just remember it however you normally approach it and you'll be fantastic whenever you answer these questions. Okay density. So the density is measured in grams per centimeter cubed or kilograms per meter cubed and we can calculate it by doing mass divided by volume we can calculate the mass by doing density times volume and we can calculate the volume by taking the mass and dividing it by the density so that's how you'd approach density questions they're quite often linked with volume questions you may need to find the volume of a, a certain shape a certain 3d shape and then you can find perhaps the mass of it by multiplying the volume by the density and so on some students may use a triangle to remember density so they would draw this triangle with a d and m and a v and if for instance you wanted to calculate density you'd cover it up and do mass divided by volume. If you want to calculate volume, you do mass divided by density. And if you want to calculate the mass, you do density times volume. Obviously, with this stage with two days to go, use whatever approach that you're confident with whenever you're dealing with density. Okay, next, pressure. So pressure is found by taking the force and dividing by the area. And we can calculate the force by doing pressure times area. And the area can be found by taking the force and dividing it by the pressure. And again, if you use a triangle, it would look something like this. And you would, you would have P, F, and A. And if you wanted to work out the pressure, you cover up the P and you do force divided by area. If you want to find the area, you do force divided by pressure. And if you want to find the force, you take the pressure and multiply it by the area. And that's it. And again, if with two days to go, use whatever approach you're confident with whenever you're dealing with pressure. Okay, next topic, geometric proof. So with geometric proof, I'd highly recommend you watch the video because with geometric proof, there's a range of situations that you may encounter with geometric proof. Also, I'd highly recommend having a look at the practice questions under the further math section because that's where I think my further my questions on geometric proof are. So here we've got a circle and we're told some information and we want to prove that angle DOE is equal to 3x. We want to show this angle is equal to 3x. Now, often with geometric proof questions, you'd have to write down your reasoning for each of your steps. And I'm just going to show you how I would do this and then I'll tell you what I'd write down. So we're told 
told that AC, this line here, is the same length as OD. So we're told that they're the same length as each other, here to here and here to here. Now this is the radius, and that's also the radius from O to C. So that means this is an isosceles triangle. So it's got a line of symmetry. So if that angle's X, this angle over here would be X as well. And I'd write that down. I'd write down that this is an isosceles triangle because that length is the same length as that length. So that means the angle AOC is equal to X. So I'd be writing that down if I was told to explain my reasons. Okay, next, this angle here. This angle here, ACO, this angle here would be equal to 180 degrees minus 2x because I know that the angles in a triangle add up to 180 degrees. And if I add these two together and take it away from 180 degrees, what's left would be this angle. So I've just written that down. And I, again, I write that reason down. Next, I know that this angle and this angle make a straight line. So these two would add together to be 180. So that means that this angle here has to be 2x. And again, I would write that down, my reason. Next, we've got another isosceles triangle, so that would be 2x over there. And again, I would write that reason down. This angle at the top here, well, if I add these two together, that would be 4x. So this angle at the top would be 180 degrees minus 4x. And then finally, if we wanted to find the size of this angle, let's just call it y. I know that x plus 180 degrees minus 4x plus y must be 180 degrees. So that would give me a little equation I'd write. So then if I simplified this, I would get... So minus 4x plus x is minus 3x. I would then take 180 from both sides. And then I would add 3x to both sides. And that gives me that y is 3x. And then we've proved that angle is equal to 3x. In terms of geometric proof, it's hard to predict what type of diagram they're going to come up with. So I'd highly recommend having a look at the questions on Corbett Maths just to give yourself a bit more practice on geometric proof. Okay, next, congruent triangle. So if you want to say that the two triangles are congruent to each other, the same shape and sides, so there's some conditions that allow you to just say that without having to work out all the sides and all the angles. So if you've got side, 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 so you know all three sides, then the two triangles will be congruent to each other. Angle, side, angle. So if you've got an angle, the side in between them and the other angle, like so, then they will be congruent triangles. If you've got side, angle, side, so then you know that they're going to be congruent to each other. Right angle, hypotenuse, side. So if you've got a right angle, the hypotenuse on one of the sides, Sides, then they're congruent triangles to each other. So it's important to know those conditions. Finally, the last one we're going to look at is invariant points. So whenever you do a transformation, if you get any points that are in the same position before the transformation as after the transformation, they're called invariant points. So if A, B, C is reflected in the y-axis, and the question said, are there any invariant points? And the answer would be yes, because this point A is invariant. So the answer is yes. And if we asked you to write down which point it would be A or the point 0, 1, that point would be invariant. It stayed where it was after the transformation. And that's it. And that's it. So in this video, we've looked at angle and parallel lines so make sure you know your alternate angles so some people call them z angles but make sure you call them alternate angles your corresponding angles such as your top right your top right your bottom left your bottom left your top left your top left and so on so they'll be equal to each other know your co-interior angles and the fact that they add to 180 degrees and also know that if you get two lines that cross each other the angles opposite each other are equal to each other and that's called vertically opposite make sure you know how to answer bearings questions so remember bearings are measured clockwise from north it has to have three digits so if you've got a bearing less than 100 make sure that you put a zero in front of it and also make sure you know how to work out back bearings. So you could draw a little diagram and consider your co-interior angles. Or if your bearing is less than 180 degrees, you can just add 180 degrees. Or if it's 180 degrees or larger, you can just take away 180 degrees and that'll tell you the back bearings. Angles and polygons, know the angles and polygons, know the angles on the triangle add up to 180, a quadrilateral 360, a pentagon 540, a hexagon 720, and so on. Then make sure also you know the formula to work out the sum of those interior angles for other polygons. So N minus 2 times 180, so take 2 off the number of sides and multiply by 180 degrees and that'll tell you the sum of the interior angles also know what the term regular means so if it's a regular polygon all the sides are the same length and all the interior angles are the same they're all equal to each other and all the exterior angles will be equal to each other as well know that all the exterior angles will always add together to be 360 degrees and that's quite useful i know that the interior angle and the exterior angle will add together to be 180 degrees Constructions, know how to construct your perpendicular bisector, your angle bisector, your perpendicular to a point, through a point, and so on. So make sure you know how to do your constructions and make sure you get your compass and you make sure you're ready for that whenever you do the exam. Loci, make sure you know how to do those questions whenever you have to show on a particular diagram the possible positions that satisfy the conditions. Your constructions might be useful for that as well. Views, make sure you know how to draw your front elevation, the view from the front, the side elevation, the view from one of the sides, and the plan view, the view from the top. The air for trapezium, a half of A plus B times H. In other words, you add together the length of two parallel sides, half it, and then times by h the distance between them. 
circumference. Circumference is pi times diameter. Means you know you can find the circumference of a circle by doing pi times diameter. The area of a circle, but area is pi r squared. So make sure you can do pi r squared to get the area of the circle. Arc length, make sure you know how to work out the length of an arc by doing v to over 360, multiplied by pi, multiplied by the diameter. In other words, it's the fraction of the circumference. So you just put the angle over 360 and multiply that by the circumference. Likewise, for the area of the sector, it's the same as the fraction of the whole area. So you're going to do v to over 360, multiplied by pi r squared. Volume of a cylinder, so you do pi r squared and then multiply by how long or how tall the cylinder is. So that's the area of the cross section, multiply by how long it is. Pythagoras' theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So make sure you can use Pythagoras' theorem. Trigonometry, so remember your two old angels skipped over heaven, kine harp, or soca toa, that sine is equal to the opposite divided by the hypotenuse, that the cos is equal to the adjacent divided by the hypotenuse, and the tan is equal to the opposite divided by the adjacent. Make sure you know how to do your 3D trigonometry and Pythagoras questions. So make sure you draw out the little triangles can be useful for those as well. Exact trig values, make sure you learn your exact trig values and how to use them. You may encounter them in questions even involving third, so you may have to then add them and so on. So make sure you know your exact trig values. Volume of a prism, so that's the area of the cross section, multiplied by how long the prism is. The volume of a cone, remember that's given to you, that's a third pi r squared multiplied by the height of the cone. The volume of a pyramid, so it's a third the area of the base times the height, but the volume of a cone will help you with that. And the volume of a sphere, it's given to you as well, four thirds pi r cubed. The volume of a frustrum, remember that's when the, the top's chopped off a cone or a pyramid, so just get the volume of the whole original cone or pyramid, and then find the volume of the bit that's taken off, and then, then take them away from each other and see what's left. The surface area of a prism, so just work out the area of all the faces and add them up. The surface area of cones and spheres, remember they're given to you as well, so they'll be in the formula sheet. Metric units for area and volume, so if you wanted to change perhaps from meters squared into centimeters squared, you're going to multiply by 10,000. If you want to change from meters cubed to centimeters cubed, you multiply by a million. Translations, that's where you slide the shapes on grids, make sure you know the translation vectors and how to use them. And if you're translating a shape, do one point at a time. Reflections, make sure you know how to reflect a line on the x-axis, the y-axis. Vertical lines, such as x equals 4, x equals minus 1. Horizontal lines, such as y equals 4, or y equals minus 3, and things like that. The diagonal lines, which is y equals x and y equals negative x. Rotations, make sure you know how to rotate shapes on grids. Remember, you're entitled to tracing paper, so feel free to put up your hand whenever you go into the exam hall and ask for that tracing paper. Enlargements, make sure you know how to enlarge shapes on grids, but also whenever you've got fractional scale factors and negative scale factors, and if it's a negative scale factor, it goes in the opposite direction. Similar shapes, so if the scale factor of enlargements for the sides is n, for the scale factor for the areas would be n squared, and for the volumes would be n cubed, so make sure you know those as well. Circle frames, so know your circle frames, such as the angle and the semicircle, that triangle, that angle at the top would be equal to 90 degrees. The fact the angle at the circumference would be half the angle at the center. Your alternate segment frame, know what that is. Your cyclic quadrilaterals, the angles in the same segment, and so on. The sine rule, so if you've got sides and angles opposite each other, the sine rule is really useful, and it's A over sine A equals B over sine B, and that's really useful if if you're finding the length of sides, if you find the length of an angle, flip it over and do sine A over little a equals sine B over little b. The cosine rule is really useful whenever you've got two sides and the angle in between them. You can use the cosine rule to work out the length of the third side. Also, if you've got all three sides of the triangle, the cosine rule can be used to work out the size of one of the angles. If you want to find the area of a triangle, half A, B, sine C is really useful. And A and B are the two sides and C is the angle in between them. Vectors, make sure you can answer vectors questions. If you want to show that two vectors are parallel, you show the multiples of each other. Also, if you want to show that three points are in a straight line, find the two vectors and show they're parallel and they pass through the same points. So it must be a straight line. Column vectors, make sure you do questions, perhaps add in column vectors and so on. Travel graphs, make sure you can answer your travel graph questions. Speed, distance, time, make sure you know speed is equal to distance divided by time and also distance equal to speed times time and time is equal to distance divided by speed. Likewise for density, the density is equal to the mass divided by the volume and so on. The pressure is equal to the force divided by the area. Geometric proof, make sure you can answer geometric proof questions and just practice those. Congruent triangles, so they're your conditions such as side, 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 angle, side, angle, Angle, side, angle, side, and right angle, hypotenuse, and side. And a very important set of the points that stay in the same position whenever you do transformations. And that's it. And that's it. So we've gone through recaps of the number topics, the statistics topics, the algebra topics, and today we're going through the geometry and the shapes for symmetry topics. So I really hope you find these recaps useful. There's obviously two days to go to your GCC Maps exam, so these recaps will be really useful for you whenever you do that exam the day after tomorrow. Tomorrow's going to be our last video. <laughs> I know, I could, could shed a tear. <laughs> I'm exhausted after making these 200 odd videos. Um, but in terms of these videos, um, I really hope you find them useful. Tomorrow's the last video. I'm going to bring it out a lot earlier than the other videos. So I'm going to bring it out about 10 o'clock or 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. So keep an eye on YouTube for that last video. 
It's a good luck message for me, but also it's going to go through some tips in terms of your revision tomorrow and then going into the exam and just some tips for me on that. So I'll see you tomorrow for the last video and thanks very much. Cheers. Bye.